morning for a few minutes, if I could, about staying in the ship. In this chapter in the book of Acts in 27, if you read the entire thing, you see that these people were facing a major catastrophe. Folks, I want to, I don't want to sound like a prophet of doom, but at the same time, sometimes we need to be reminded that we're in a perilous time in this country. And we're in a perilous time in this world that we live in. As the apostles showed Jesus the temple, how pretty it was, Jesus made a statement to them. He said, Behold, there will not be one stone left standing on another. And they later on as they went out away from the temple, they got together with Him and they asked Him, to tell him them when all of these things were going to come to pass and when the end of the world was going to be. Now he could have told them that. But as you go back there and look at this scripture, you see that he didn't tell them anything except a sign that would come to pass and a sign that would happen in the, because, uh, at the time of the end time. Now, as you compare the Scriptures with the day and time that we live in right now, and the turmoils, all of the strife that is going on, all of the problems that are going on within countries, we see these signs that Jesus talked about coming to pass. And man's heart will fail him because of fear that comes upon him because of the things that are coming upon the earth. Now, I hope this morning that we can leave this church house understanding that we're serving a God that lives inside of us and that we are not of this world. That we're in it and we have to walk around in it, but we're not of it. Praise God this morning. That we are a separate people, that we live a separate life from the lives of other people that are not Christians, that are not born again. So therefore, we have a God this morning that we can go to in prayer and ask Him for anything that we need. And according to Scriptures, the Bible says that He will supply that need. The problem is getting church to understand what the Word of God says and getting church to understand that we need to comply with that Word. We can't go around it. We can't change it. We can't bypass it and sugarcoat it. We have to do exactly what it says. And so therefore, these people that we're going to talk about in a second or two were facing sudden death. And every one of them on that ship knew that. And so consequently, uh, actions were taken or they were taking actions or, or doing things to try to prevent this accident from happening. You and I this morning, as Christian people, can understand that our God has said that if His people who are called by His name will depart from sin and call upon His name, He would hear and He would answer and He would heal the land. And if there's ever been a land in the history of this world that needs to be healed, it's the United States of America. Don't, don't misunderstand me this morning. I'm not down on America. I believe in that old song that says, wash her pretty face, dry her eyes, and then God bless America again. That's my prayer this morning. But I'm only one, and we're only one church. But it's time for God's people to unite their shields of faith together and stand up against a common enemy. And that common enemy is Satan himself that is trying to bring destruction on this country and he's trying to bring destruction on the church. He's doing everything he can to create a division in the church, to create people that uh, are, are not happy within themselves. They're not happy with the church. But I want to understand and I want you to understand this morning Let's stay in the boat. Let's stay in the ship. Let's don't even think about getting out of the church or leaving the church and finding something somewhere else because everything that we need is right here in this building. Amen. Glory be to God. 
As you look at the word in Acts 27 and 30, and as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under the color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Pray with me, Heavenly Father. Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask you for the Holy Ghost to just hover down over us this morning, Lord, and use us to your glory. Father, I ask you for nothing more than your will and nothing less. Ask you now that your grace and mercy and blessing would be upon the Word. Open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear your Word, to understand your Word, and to take it with us as we leave this place, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pay attention to what Paul said in verse 31. Except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Now how did Paul know this? How could he stand up and tell these people that not one hair of their head would be lost? How could he have that kind of confidence? How could he make a statement like that when he had no idea that whether that ship was going to run aground and be, uh, be destroyed and the people all drowned. The way he knew that was that the night before, an angel come and stood beside him and told him as much. Now we're living in the New Testament era of time and we're living in a time when men think that the Bible or everybody, most of the people in the world today think that the Bible is some kind of fairy book or fairy tale. It's a big joke. But let me tell you something this morning. Everything in that book is real and everything in that book is going to come to pass. And so therefore, since God had sent the angel to tell him what to tell the people on the ship, then they would understand and not be afraid. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you're visiting with us and you've never heard Doug Combs preach, we have a preacher here this, in this church that preaches the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a preacher that stands behind this pulpit under the anointing of the Holy Ghost of God and thereby, praise the name of the Lord, presents the gospel so that we can understand what he's talking about. It's a special blessing to know this. It's a special blessing to be able to understand and know that when we come to church and walk through the door, that the man of God is going to walk behind that pulpit and when he does, he totally changes. He becomes a different person. And the Holy Ghost takes over and we hear the Word of God. Let it come to the place to where that it doesn't just go in this ear and out this ear, but it goes in this ear and down into the heart. And do like old uh, uh, Brother Kenneth Copeland said, that we keep studying the Word and hearing the Word and building on the Word until we're able to overcome in the Word. Amen. Glory be to God anyway. Paul writing to the church in 1 Corinthians 12 and 27 makes a statement that I wonder if over time People haven't kind of just read over these things and just looked at them and seen them. They know they're there, but they don't fully understand what it means. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. I want to take you back to a road going from Jerusalem to Damascus. And this same man that wrote this, uh, this epistle in the Scriptures was on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus not to go over there and arrest people. He was going over there to bring Christian people, church members, out of Damascus back to Jerusalem and they would have been fed to the lions. Now I want you to listen to what happened on that road to Damascus. The Bible says as he was traveling, a bright light shined around him. 
That light was so bright that it blinded him. It put scales on his eyes. And he heard a voice that made a statement. And let's pay attention to what this statement said. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now think something with me for a minute, church. Think about what he just said. Why persecutest thou me? And if old Paul could have said back to him, he would say, Lord, I'm not persecuting you. I'm going after them Christians. I'm going after the church over in Damascus. But you see, Jesus is letting Paul know that when you come after the church, you come after Him. When you touch the church, you're touching Him. This is what, what Paul needed to see and understand. And so consequently this morning, it's time for us to realize that when we come together and walk through that door, we change from being a single person under the body of Jesus Christ. And in this body of Jesus Christ, He loves it the same way that a man loves his wife. He said, will a man uh, hurt his own self? Will he cut his own self to see if he bleeds? No. Because we nourish this thing that we live in. We feed it. We pet it. We comb its hair every day. We brush its teeth and take good care of it. Jesus is saying the same thing. If we do that and man does that, how much more will he do for his wife or his body? Praise God anyway. Glory be to God. Now you are a body of Christ and members in particular. Do you fully understand what this means? Think about something with me. You want to buy a house. Or let's go further than that. Let's go to the company that you may have worked in. Did you feel like you were part of that company? Did you feel like you were special to that company? That you had a, a job to do within the company and so therefore it meant that you were a member or a particular person in that company. The same principle applies in the church this morning. If we're saved, we're born again by the Spirit of God. If the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied, then we are a member of the body of Christ. We are a member of the church. And we mean something. We count something. We're worth something. Praise God anyway. We're so important that Jesus Christ hung on the cross of Calvary and spilled the blood out of His body so that we could have salvation this morning. That's how important you are. That's how important you are to God Almighty. And so therefore, we don't have to take second seat to nobody. We can stand up and be counted this morning because we are the children of God. We're not uh, people piddling around in this world down here, but we have the power of God working with us and in us and through us. And since we do, we can stand up and lay hands on the sick and that person recover from that sickness. Glory be to God anyway. Glory be to God. But too many times, God's people walk around like a suck egg dog with their tails stuck between their legs, thinking that they're different from the world. I am different from the world. I realize that this morning. I realize that there are gifts in this life that I live that are capable of doing things beyond my imagination. Glory be to God anyway. Jesus said to the church, Speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain and it will be moved. Speak to the mountain and tell it to cast, be cast into the sea and it will happen. My Lord, how, that is so stupid, isn't it? That sounds so ridiculous. He also said, Say to the sycamine tree, Be plucked up by the roots and be transplanted in the sea. And that still sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But Jesus is trying to show the church this morning and the Holy Ghost is trying to show the church this morning that we have the power of God working in the church. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. And then look in Ephesians 4.11 if you will. Ephesians, God, Paul writing to the Ephesian church 
was explaining to the Ephesians and also to you and I and to other churches in Asia because they would read the same thing you and I read. Ephesians 4.11 said, And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Are you hearing me this morning? What are these people for? What are, they, what are they given to the church for? Why is there pastors in a church? Why are there uh, evangelists in a church? Why are they prophets in a church? Now I want to ask you a question. In the last 15 years, how many times have you heard a prophet stand up and prophesy? Think with me, church. Think where we're at. Think where we're at. This is where we're at. That none of the gifts of the Holy Ghost are working in the church. None of the gifts of the Holy Ghost are working in churches in the United States of America today because we have become so uh, oriented and uh, don't want to hurt anybody's feelings that we won't preach the gospel anymore. Come on, pray for me. Look where we're at this morning. How many times have you heard men walk in a pulpit and read a story to you? Preachers have gone to the place to where that we depend more on a CD than we do on the Holy Ghost giving unction. Stay with me. I'm not talking down to you. This is my church. I'm part of this church. And I didn't move here from Florida to preach in this church. I want you to understand that. I don't know how I got here. I don't know why we come to this place. All right, other than the fact that the Spirit of God has something that we can do here. And He brought us here for that purpose. Our whole family is down in Florida. All of our children, our grandchildren are down there. Two of them drove all day yesterday to get here just to visit with us. This is what we have done and didn't have any, didn't really, you think it's a joke, but we had no realization of why we did it. I know now. And he gave some apostles, some preach, uh, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? What did he give the church these people for? For the perfecting of the saints of God. For the perfecting of the saints of God. Now I'm going to say something that will fill your basket. You can read the Bible all day long. And it won't have one tenth of effect that hearing the Word of God preached from a preacher or pastor in a pulpit that's preaching the Gospel of Christ will have more power for ten minutes than you reading the Bible all day long because you are hearing the Word of God. Glory be to God anyway. Given for, given for perfection. You see, Jesus is coming back. We believe that. Well, I got a story for you this morning. Are you perfect? Is the church perfect? Well, Scripture says He's going to come back after a, a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You see, it's important. It is important for you and I to realize how much effect we have on the church just by coming and sitting down in it. Are you listening? You see, when a person gets disgusted and becomes concerned about things that are happening in the world and they become so afraid that the first thing they want to do is quit paying their tithes and quit giving to the church and leave the church without realizing the effect that it has on the church. Listen to me. Please listen to me this morning. 
This is important because we're living in a perilous time. We, we look back and see 911. But I got a story to tell you. If I'm right in the scriptures, there's a time fixing to happen right down the road very shortly that will make 911 look like a Sunday school class. It's time for the church to realize this. And when it happens, then fear comes. And Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. For lo, I am with you even unto the end. Glory be to God anyway. Ephesians 4.12 For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Romans 8 and 8 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. My Lord, when we think about these things, and think about how important we are to the church and to the ministry in the church. You see, we can't preach without you praying. Pastor can't pastor this church without us praying. He needs every prayer that you can give and every prayer that you can put up. Now, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. This sanctifying thing is important. It's important to us. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. In the last 15 years, how many sermons have you heard on sanctification? How many sermons have you heard on the baptism of the Holy Ghost? How many sermons have you heard concerning the nine gifts of the Holy Ghost in the church. You see, we can, we can grasp, we can grasp the armor of God. We can get that in our mind and we can understand what it means and how it works. That armor has no backplate on it. It's wide open in the back. It's only designed as a frontal attack against an enemy. Meaning that we have power over the power of the enemy through the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of God given to the church. There's healing in this church, folks. There is salvation in this church. There is total deliverance in this church. We have to accept it. We have to look for it. Yes, just a little bit more and I'll let you go. I might have been just putting fun about them two hours. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In Romans 8 and 11, the Word of God tells us something that is important to us as Christian people if we want it. If we want it. But if we want to be happy just like we are and sit on that limb that we're on until some evangelist comes along with enough intestinal fortitude to saw the limb off and make you climb to a higher limb, if we're satisfied, then we won't have this. The Word of God says, If the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then He will quicken your mortal body by His Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead. Amen. You hear me this morning? What does quickening mean? All oh, the Holy Ghost is here. I, I, uh, oh, praise the name of the Lord. What does quickening mean? What does quickening mean? It means to make alive. To make alive. That same Holy Ghost that you have in you that talks every once in a while when you get to the place to where you allow Him to talk, that same Holy Ghost 
is the quickening Spirit of Almighty God living in this temple. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But you see, in our finite mind, in our mind, our human mind, we want to think just the opposite. All right? We want to think that this body is alive. This body is not alive, dear heart. It is the Spirit in the body that is rejuvenated. It is the Spirit in the body that is born again. It is the Spirit in the body that becomes strong enough to overpower the body. It is the Spirit within the body that becomes powerful enough to give us victory over death, hell, and the grave. Glory be to God anyway. You hear me? There's healing in the church. I don't care. I take a handful of pills every day just like you do. Why? Lack of faith. Pure and simple. Pure and simple. But when we get to the place to where we can love one another enough that if it push come to shove, we would bear that pain that they're bearing for them, then healing will come in that person's body. We have to get to the place to where we obey the two laws of Jesus Christ. Not the old mosaical thing, but the two laws that Jesus made. Love ye one another even as I have loved you. Again I say unto you, love, have love one unto another as I have, had, as I have unto you. In other words, you can take the quarter out of your pocket and you can hold it up and say, Brother David, this is, this is for you. For, F-O-R. Meaning it's going to be down the road somewhere I'm going to get it. But if you hand that quarter to me and say this is to you, then I've got it in my pocket. Are you listening this morning? When we get to the place to where that we can manifest the love of God through the anointing of the Holy Ghost one to another, then we'll see the power of God moving and working in the church again like it's supposed to. This is not a put down on you as a Christian. It's not a put down on you as a church of God member. It's an encouragement that it's time for us to realize who we are. We're not back box, chatter boxing. We're not beating against the wind. We know what we're supposed to do. We know what we're capable of doing. Let's do it. Let's do it. Stand with me. <clears throat> Brother Doug has Sister Mary Jane go play. But let's just be still for a second in the presence of the Lord. I want you to look at me right here. I don't want you to bow your head because we're going to come to a place sooner or later, either through the way of death or by the rapture, when we're going to look at a man dead on. We're going to look him right in the face. We won't be able to check and see if the birds are singing See if the sun's shining. We won't be able to do all that. So I say unto you this morning, how is it with you? How is it with your spirit? How is it with your soul this morning? Are you prepared for this time to come? Are you ready for that time to come? Look down inside past the collarbone and look at the heart. Without thinking, look at the heart and check and see where the heart is at this morning. For the Word tells us where our heart is, there will our spirit be or there will be, we be also. Listen to me. If you're here this morning and you have a need of any kind, alright, I'm not going to ask the elders and put them under obligation to stay, but I'm going to stay with you. 
If there's anyone here that you have a need this morning and you would like to be anointed and prayed for individually, then as we dismiss church and people are allowed to leave that don't want to stay, form a line right here and we will have a prayer line this morning.